Welcome. We're coming to you from Montpellier, where a special summit aimed at resetting ties between Africa and France has just wrapped up. A fresh start, a fresh approach, but clearly still some very old resentments. France's continued reliance on its post-colonial ties can't be sidestepped quite so easily. But the summit, which gathered together a lot of young people from across Africa and France with not a head of state inside except for Macron, was supposed to signal a new start. But some feared that it was just window dressing for a relationship that continues to be as fraught as ever. Macron says, though, that he does believe that a shift is possible. We've not chosen our history or our geography, including the most tragic chapters, the responsibilities that we can't hide and the clarity that we must have. We are the heirs of all of this. But our generation, all of us, as we are, the question that's being asked of us is how do we embrace and build our future? And the debt that we owe to the African continent is a debt to a continent which is continuing to grow in an incredible manner. It's a continent of promise, of hope. So, as you can see, there's a lot of music, there's a skate park behind me, there was some break dancing. This summit is clearly cooler than any that have come before. But is that enough to bring about concrete change? The summit culminated in a debate between 11 young people from across the continent focused on bringing about practical policy changes and bringing about a future that really, it really embodies their hopes and President Macron. Now, Amina was one of those. Amina, um, how do you think that conversation went? I think it was an extremely intense conversation, but that was very much needed. Uh, we came here to bring out intensity and clarity and, and tough conversations, and I think we brought exactly that. Uh, that conversation was harder than we expected. Mm -hmm. It was also much lighter than we expected. We had the laugh, uh, we had an emotional time, and we also went on to very deep topics. Uh, topics that I don't think were ever discussed in a summit before, and that's what the youth brings. It's some clarity to all of this. Yeah, it was really exhilarating to watch, actually, because you were saying to me before that you guys really planned on, on calling Macron out. And from sitting in the audience, it really felt that, like, nobody was pulling any punches. But do you think that has any chance of actually bringing about any kind of concrete change? To be honest with you, we wanted to show something new right now and we wanted to make a point and show that this isn't just food for thought but room for improvement. We really wanted to show that we were energetic and confident and strong enough to bring about change. So it will bring change. It already did. There is a symbol that happened today. There's something quite different that happened today. It was in the air. It was in the room. And I truly believe that. Right now, nobody can deny it anymore. He can't deny it anymore. He said things, he actually committed to things that I'm really, really certain will happen. And if he doesn't try, we'll make sure he, he's reminded that we must do it. So. And so what were some of those things? He was talking about the fund for democracy. That fund, if it's not led by civil societies, will mean nothing to us. That fund, if it is just one other fund that is close to development aid, will mean nothing to us. So we're expecting him to actually include us in the process, in decision making, in the way that we allocate budgets. We really actually want civil societies to be part of that process. Same thing goes for the migration forum. He's expecting us to actually want just a one-year forum to talk about the great things of migration. That's not enough. We want it to be a network. We want it to be a regular conversation. We're happy to lead that, that conversation. We're happy to do it. He, he's just got to give us a go and we're ready to do that. And he's committed to other things. He's committed to actually changing the narrative and the symbols. And I actually do believe that he's truthful about that. We just need to push him enough for it to change. Not tomorrow, not in 2030, tonight. Because he did really try to push over the fact that, that what he was saying is are his sincere beliefs. And actually, there was quite an emotional element to a lot of the conversations that were going on. Do you think that that 
is important in these kinds of conversations? Yes, it really is about the consideration that he's given us tonight. Uh, so far, I don't think civil societies and people have been uh, feeling considered in the conversation, have been part of the conversation. Too often we are uh, just an object of conversation, very little actual member of that conversation, and he included us in that, and we forced him to include us in that. So that was a big change for us. And even more so, I really do feel that he was sincere, that I truly believe. But he somehow stayed in some parts in his role as president. And I don't think he wanted to do that. I really do think that he wanted to, like like my, my friend Sheikh said, dro drop the jacket, drop the vest, be a person and actually talk about those things that link us as human beings. And I think that the conversation must continue for him to be able to do that with us. And you actually got, you guys actually had a conversation with him early on in the week on, yeah, on Tuesday. Um, if it's not going to put you in too much of a difficult position, <laughs> do you think fine. anything changed between that, that kind of pre-chat that you had and what you saw today? Yes. To be clear, the chat that we had was not for us to actually provide him with like hints of what we were going to tell him on Friday or to provide with like a plan of what we were doing on Friday. The truth of it all is that we just came there to introduce ourselves, which we didn't want to do in too much length on Friday today because we were not speaking for ourselves, we were speaking for 5,000 kids and more than that, an entire generation, so it wasn't about us. But on Tuesday, it was about getting to know us personally. And there was one thing, I think you remember that, that whole pot thing, you know, the marmite, the whole pot thing. That conversation arrived on Tuesday, and we had that conversation. Well, so, so maybe for those who have, perhaps wasn't forward following it, one of the speakers um, brought up this this metaphor of like yes. a, a pot needing yes. to be cleaned, yes. and that kind of took ran away with yeah. a lot of the conversations. Yeah, 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 and like on Tuesday, he actually went with the conversation too. So she brought about this idea of like a dirty pot. That dirty pot is our relationship, and the dirt in it is everything that has strained our relationship. All that heavy and painful past that exists between our our continent and France. And uh, on Tuesday, he said that he wasn't going to clean the pot, that we had to compose with a dirty pot and that perhaps some healthy meals will come out of it. Tonight, he said he will clean the pot. I know this conversation sounds absurd, but in but a way... But it's a metaphor. It's a massive metaphor. And more than that, it's a huge symbol. And it's a huge symbol of him actually listening, actually getting to understand that what you saw as emotionalism, what you saw as catharsis, was actually like an actual call out, like just a need to call him out and to make sure that we're on the same page. And with that, he showed us that we were actually on the same page. So we're quite happy about it. Uh, thanks so much, Amina. So I'm just going to stop you there um, because um, in considering the future of both France and Africa, things like the environment are issues that can't be ignored. And one of the issues that was also raised today was this call for ethical business practices. Their fears that multinationals will continue to ex extract African resources and the continent will suffer from that. So we're now going to cross to a report from one of our correspondents in DR Congo about some of the impact of multinational operations there and the efforts on the ground to try and combat that. This is Lusanga, formerly known as Leverville. In the mid-20th century, British-Dutch multinational Unilever turned it into a major hub for palm oil production. Over the years, intensive farming has depleted the soil and locals have been burning down parts of the forest in search of arable land. To stop this, a local NGO, Ocean, set up an agroforestry programme in 2014. Since then, 20,000 trees have been planted amid cassava and vegetable crops. Agroforestry is the combination of trees with agriculture. Trees fertilize the soil, and as a result, farmers can use the land for much longer. Small-scale agriculture is responsible for 90% of forest loss in DR Congo, but illegal logging is also rampant. In Kinshasa, Ocean and other NGOs have been fighting to get nine forest concessions cancelled. They were granted by the government to Chinese companies in violation of a 2002 moratorium. The case has been brought before the State Council. A key part of our advocacy work involves using the judicial system to challenge government decisions. When a decision is illegal, we have no other choice than to take legal action. 
Being a conservationist can be risky. In 2016, this man accused a top general in the Congolese army of illegal logging. His son was later kidnapped and was never seen again. It's very dangerous because when you speak out against people who make millions from illegal activities, you become a target. I've lost a child, but I'm defending a just cause and I will continue to defend it. The battle is growing increasingly urgent, according to a study by the University of Maryland. At the current pace of destruction, all of DRC's primary forests will have been cleared by the end of the century. Now, the summit covered a lot of ground, and another part of uh, the, the big messages that came out of it was a call for healthier cooperation between the continent and Africa. Now, one of the ways that that could manifest is uh, widening educational cooperation. Now, one of the biggest existing programs that kind of help does do that, does that, uh, help, help, do, that helps do that, um, not just between France and Africa, but also the European Union and the continent is Erasmus+, Plus, which helps hundreds of young Africans head over to Europe to study every year. But many want to see initiatives like that expanded. That was one of the recommendations by post-colonial theorist Achille Bembe, who's originally from Cameroon, who was one of those who, who really helped pull this summit together and was behind uh, pulling out several, uh, 13 in fact, uh, recommendations to Macron after having spent months speaking to people from across the continent about what they thought would be important in healing, resetting, reshaping the relationship between Africa and uh, France. So this report from our correspondents uh, on the benefit of Erasmus Plus to African uh, young people, particularly those in Senegal. Take a look. Lamine is one of the latest participants in the Erasmus Plus programme in Senegal. He was selected by his university in Dakar to study at a Spanish university for three months. This computer scientist is working on 5G, the latest mobile network technology. It's a program that's allowed me to develop skills in my work within this postdoctoral fellowship program. I was able to study antenna measurements in depth. I got to work in a well-equipped laboratory and met with experts in this field. Between 2017 and 2020, nearly 3,000 African students were enrolled in Erasmus+, Plus, including 215 Senegalese students. Through the programme, students can obtain a European degree in addition to a degree from their home country. When you go abroad, you're bound to see something else, experience another way of doing things. So all these benefit students. Most of the students who benefit from this program would not have been able to go abroad if there was no Erasmus+. Plus. So it provides logistical support, which is extremely important. The Ministry of Higher Education welcomes the positive impact of Erasmus+, Plus, but it wants the profiles of students sent to Europe to better meet the needs of the Senegalese job market. There is a risk that these students will be trained in fields where there are few opportunities in Senegal. For these programs to be successful, it is important that we are truly involved in a co-construction process so that these cooperation programs are useful for higher education, useful for our research and useful for the development of our country. Erasmus Plus is also involved in improving the quality of African universities. The program helps to improve teaching facilities by financing capacity building programs and in Dakar, it supported the creation of an online research hub at the Polytechnic University. And Ashil Bembe himself, uh, prior to get coming on board for organising all of this, was known for his criticism of Macron. And since getting involved, he actually also came in for criticism himself by other African um, intellectuals who are sceptical about what kind of benefit this can yield. But Bembe has really insisted that what this is is a step towards change and that the expectation shouldn't be any kind of overnight shift, but that any benefit that can come from this will be a long-term project. One summit isn't enough to change relations, but it's a first milestone in a very long process that is likely to last one or two generations. We need to involve entire societies to re-establish and to mend ties that have been damaged. 
That way, we can start a new dynamic to face tomorrow's great challenges and debates. Okay, so Amina, we don't have much time left, but one of the important aspects of those young people who were chosen is the work that they've done to try and affect the communities around them. Now, you yourself, you've set up a public policy organization. Why did you feel a need for that? Honestly, it came about with the, the frustration of not being part of the conversation and understanding, quite frankly, that the youth don't, doesn't really understand and grasp the nature of public policy, how our cities work, what we do with our actual tourism policies, what our uh, realities are and what are the rules that actually like administrate us every day. And I, I think that's unbearable, to be quite honest with you, and I think that's unbearable that we are not the agents of change with that. And so we created Je m'engage pour l'Afrique, I'm committed to Africa. You're from Morocco. Is it just yeah. about Morocco? No, absolutely not. It's a completely inclusive organization that uh, takes a full span of the entire African continent in relations to France, in relations to Europe. So far, we're very much attached to Western, Northern and uh, Central Africa, but English-speaking countries are more than welcome to join into the conversation. What we do is basically we write public policy recommendations and we push as hard as we can for us to be heard by the decision makers and the policy makers. And so far, I mean, I think it's working. Well, thank you so much, Amina. It's amazing the work that you've done and how far you've gone to try and actually shape things rather than just observe them. Thank you all for joining us for this special edition of Eye on Africa coming from Montpellier, the Africa-France Summit. Take care. Join us again next time if you can.